Um, this podcast is brought to you by the Almamac and Scientific Canada. It was recorded on the traditional territories shared between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Enjoy. I feel like I just butchered that again, even though we. That's close enough. <laughs> we just had the conversation. Okay. My research on <laughs> uh, light adaptation in the in the fish right now. I'm sitting in a kiddie pool, actually. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite nice. Oh, that would be great. But it's oh, uh, not very professional. Anyone else feel awkward on Zoom? Hey, what's up, guys? Don't forget to smash that subscribe button so you don't think that that was an, a perfect intro. No. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode. It's coming out at a different time than usual. Uh, it's extra long. It's extra visual. We're talking to Dr. John Bandler from the Electrical Engineering Department at McMaster University, and he's got a whole bunch of tips for us on how to present through our computers. So let's jump in and see what he's got to say. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Adam, and today we have a very special guest. This is what? Third time? Fourth time you're on now? I think it's the f- we've met more frequently, but this is the third time. Yeah, Dr. Bandler. Hello and welcome back. How are Good. you? <laughs> Good. Thanks, Adam. Still COVID-free, fortunately. <laughs> That's good. That's good. This is a this is a little bit new for us. Um, we we've done a, a number of interviews and we've we've hung out a couple times for sure. Uh, most of it has been in person. We've done some pre-recorded things, but again, that was in person with a little camera. This is uh, this is new for us. This is how how are you liking it? How are you liking the world of webcams and Zoom and and all that? It was a fast and furious learning curve and uh, honestly with the various competitions that I had to uh, work on um, you know I over prepared for a lot and you know over prepared and over prepared my candidates and so on so generally speaking nothing things didn't go wrong in the end but there was a, a lot of preparation. And, and that's one of the things that we might even touch on, the I, the concept of preparing. Mm-hmm. That's actually a, a fantastic little intro um, or something to, to get us started with, with your intro. One of the things that I, being in science for a number of years and having a number of different supervisors, um, I feel like a lot of science presentations are underprepared. They, they don't really run very smoothly and they're very hard to get through but you're a you're a science guy you're an engineer uh why don't you tell us a little bit about your your experiences you you're an electrical engineer you're in the engineering department at mcmaster right right well you know i've i've used zoom for example uh now in the last uh, 10 months or so in a number of different capacities Mm -hmm. for uh, regular technical research meetings with small groups at the normal and kind of normal research type meeting on the one hand, all the way through presentations, competitions of three minute thesis in particular, all the way to plays. I've actually had play readings that I plays that I wrote readings over zoom and, um, um, I am hot off the press. I've been accepted for the Hamilton Fringe Festival 2021 digital exclusives. So oh, that's congratulations. Be, that's going to be a, a video production. Oh, very so cool. I'm, I'm looking at everything from reading plays all the way through to technical technical presentations. Mm-hmm. So that, that definitely sets you apart from a lot of the, uh, the science and engineers that, that I know. Um, so, so you did a whole bunch of research, um, but now you you seem to be focusing a lot on the, the competitions and, and mentoring of, of students and, uh, a big part of your interest lies in presentations. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, and the reason is really very straightforward. When I work one-on-one or in small groups with people, I literally see tangible improvements minute by minute by minute. And that's what keeps you going, you know, it, 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 even the most hopeless case that you think is hopeless, the shyest possible person who are dragged kicking and screaming to the competition, you know, they, 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 they surprise themselves how well they can do with, with practice. Mm-hmm. 
And would you say this comes from um, your interest in in stage productions? And and you say you're you're a playwright. Right. Uh, you have some some work that's being debuted uh, fairly so- soon. Right. Is 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 that connected? Were they, you know, two things that you were always interested in: science presentations, uh, mentoring, and also uh, just artistic performance. Well, you know, I've been doing creative writing for about twenty-one years or so. When I kind of discovered uh, that's following my other artistic achievements, as you can see, the fake monets mm-hmm. behind me here—they're mine. Um, uh, if they were real monets, I'd be quite rich right so uh, probably wouldn't have them sitting on easels right (laughs) but for about for about 11 or 12 years 12 years or so I've been writing plays in particular I've had a number of Hamilton Fringe Festival productions you can see some of them have been filmed they're on my YouTube channel it's John Bandler Google John Bandler YouTube you'll see some productions there and I became interested in 2015 in uh, the three minute thesis when I, I, I'm not sure what attracted me initially, um, but I noticed that there were these speaking competitions and I start, I embarked on the three minute thesis and I've been mentoring and, and coaching 3MT students ever since. Um, and uh, so it's been quite a while and I, I, I worked one-on-one with hundreds of, hundreds of students. Uh, last year alone, I work, I work with about 80, 85 students one-on-one. Wow. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, so you've been, you've been doing the, the 3MT or three minute thesis competition um, within the uh, electrical engineering department. And typically how many people would you work with uh, in a, in a, a non zoom year, if we can call it that? Well, you know, 3MT became a required uh, part of the course in, I think it was 2017. And then we had our first co- competition within the department in 2018. Um, you know, since that time, um, it took off and it became, as I say, mandatory. You know, every student, every graduate student has to do it. Well, last year, I worked with 48 electrical engineering graduate students uh, just in my department, on top of all the other people I was working with uh, internationally, for example, Mm -hmm. um, which is another issue we can talk about later. Um, And coming up in April, I think uh, we have at least two dozen electrical engineering graduate students doing three-minute thesis. Now, these are not competitions. Uh, these are simply, but I'm trying to bring them to a competitive level, right? Um, and 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 it's worked very well. Everybody seems happy with the result. Mm-hmm. So what's um, what's the benefit that these engineering students get from preparing these three minute theses? So so for listeners that aren't totally familiar, the the idea is that um, at the the core of it, I guess, the three minute thesis was a, a competition designed to um, challenge graduate students, I believe, um, to distill their research into these three minute chunks that, um, you know, are engaging and, and have people want, you know, coming back for more, asking more questions about their, their research. So what benefit do you think these, uh, these students get from doing this and, and why has this become a, a requirement in the electrical engineering department? Well, you know, we had a poster series before, uh, which really didn't work very well. It, it was really, nobody liked it. The students didn't like it. The faculty didn't like it. They were badly prepared. They weren't really properly vetted or controlled. Mm-hmm. And it, it was, you know, very bad, very bad show. And it, it was really my enthusiasm and my desire and my, and, and, and my willingness to work with a lot of students that got the ball rolling in my department, and now now it's uh, now it's stuck. Now, what do the students get from it? Um, you know, they they learn how to articulate. They learn how to use their hands, body language. Um, they learn the art of uh, subtext, what certain phrases and words mean, whether they like it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of simplicity, the idea of being understood, 
And uh, a very good ambassador uh, is uh, Daniel Tajik from my department, who won um, first place and audience choice in an IEEE a competition in, in Hawaii in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, he, has, he did the three-minute thesis twice, once there in Hawaii and once in my department, and he won that in the department too. His, his YouTube videos of the three minute thesis have approximately 3,400 viewings. And that sort of, be, people are watching that as, 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 a, as a template. And I can see from his progress, it was very clear what the impact was of his ability to speak, uh, what impact it had on his technical presentation. His technical presentation just took off as well. Interesting. So it's this it's this idea of being aware of how you come across. Right, right. Yeah. Um I, I guess it's no surprise to to listeners that uh what makes a good speaker isn't necessarily what makes a really good researcher, but being a researcher, you, you do have to do both roles. So so it, I guess it makes sense to me. I don't know why more departments don't um you know put an emphasis on this sort of speaking well, thing. I'll tell you, it's very, very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And I think most faculty members, A, they don't have the time. Uh, they're, they're simply on to their next conference paper or next journal paper. And what are they going to spend a few hours on? The next journal paper or teaching one of their graduate students how to articulate their work? See, the yeah. problem is professors and students, as long as they can communicate with each other, everything seems to be fine. Mm -hmm. But the idea of how they communicate with other people is something that isn't really properly done. And I think f professors, frankly, are not willing to make the time. Yeah, I guess if you think about it in terms of professionally, what is the, uh, the cost benefit analysis of, of being a good public speaker? I can think of benefits. Um, I could imagine, you know, be getting getting your point across is you know very important when you're you're trying to talk about your work and everything. But if you're you know trying to get tenure or something like that, you're not necessarily looking at presentations. You're you're often looking at just hard copy papers. How many things have you published? So I guess that is a really good point. But I think for students at least, a, a lot of the experience seems to come from presentations. So. This seems like the time to really, you know, hone well, your presentation skills. Well, you know, with some of the with some of the three minute thesis candidates that I've worked with, I've I've followed up often uh, when they had applications for interviews, either job interviews, interviews for medical school, where they had to write statements, maybe make a presentation. So, and I I've even worked with faculty members, and there was a competition in my faculty a couple of years ago. Uh, which was op separate competitions, undergraduate, graduate, and faculty for big bucks. And some of the faculty members came to me for, for help. Oh. Um, so, and it's also the fact that I see how many of the people that I work with actually get to the top three or top five, in, into the top five or into the finals mm -hmm. that make it worthwhile. Um, so one of the things also you might want to ask, you know, is how the in-person 3MT differs from the virtual 3MT. And also hot off the press um, is that the School of Graduate Studies is not doing 3MT this year. So it, it has another, I'm not, not sure whether I should reveal here now what it is they're going to do, but it's not going to be three minute thesis. It'll be related to producing a video. Nevertheless, there are some, they, everybody still has, I mean, people still have to write a script. They still have to speak. Somebody has to speak and say something. Well, typically. So the idea of writing a script uh, and the idea of creating images still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but certainly one of the things that you wanted to talk to me about was the difference between virtual and in in person, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, so it's, you're still doing it this year, as you say, and obviously things have got to change. So we've talked a lot about presentation skills and like how to get your point across giving presentations in previous episodes, but that was always an in-person type thing. And well, we're not really doing that anymore. 
Um, so the last time we spoke, um, it was off camera, but uh, we were kind of throwing some ideas around and you were telling me a lot about the, the things that you had been thinking of and, um, and working on. And I'm trying to employ one right now. I don't know if you've noticed a difference. I've raised yeah. my, <laughs> I've raised my camera. I know. I've been staring into the black you're, hole. <laughs> you are more or less looking into the camera. You're not quite looking into the camera. You're actually looking at the screen. So the camera is is there, and and I'm I'm doing the same thing. It's mm -hmm. it's human nature to look at a human being speaking. It's it's unnatural to look into the camera, which is where you really are. And I know that you're down here, uh, <laughs> but that's where you should be looking. So to me, coming back to the, those two, I think the two most important things that I would think that are important for a virtual presentation of any kind is what does your backdrop look like? And, and to be truly engaging, you really need to look into the camera. That means you have to forget what's here. You have to kind of convince yourself that's where your audience is. Now, it's easier if you have memorized. And of course, with three minute thesis, uh, students have to memorize this. So once they've memorized, they can look into the camera. Or if you're speaking off the cuff like I am now, I'm still looking into the camera. Now I'm looking down at the screen where your, your image is. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is the backdrop. It's preferable to have the lines vertical behind you. Now, in my case, I have a couple of paintings on easels. And because they're on easels, it's normal that they may not be quite vertical. Mm -hmm. So really, you, it, it's, it, I, I, usually, I usually cringe when I see eminent people, prominent people with backdrops where they look like they're looking down at their laptop cameras or looking down like this and the camera's looking up with, with strange perspectives at the back. It's mm -hmm. distracting. And one of the things, if you notice, when you look at uh, TV talking heads, and we have a lot of TV talking heads now, and they're all virtual typically, you'll notice that the producers have clearly worked with those uh, interviewees before they come on camera and because lines are all incredibly by coincidence vertical mm, okay. almost almost you almost entirely vertical which means that you know and that's clearly one of the things that producers want it looks odd on a tv program with a bunch of talking heads with some lines are doing this and some lines unless it's unless it's deliberate unless it's deliberately part of the backdrop so okay, you, don't think, you don't want it to be accidental. So having those vertical lines and remembering that what's in your backdrop becomes part of the impression that you're giving. Mm -hmm. And that's an indelible impression. It's hard to let that go. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely do not recommend virtual environments because of the strange glitches and it looks kind of amateurish to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's the two issues. Look into the camera vertical lines and there's more but i'll, I'll let you ask I'm, sorry i'm doing a lot of talking here yeah yeah so so maybe we can uh so first point i want one of the things you know when you're presenting in real life you know you're often talking about like do you move around and do you walk around and how do you use your hands and who do you look at in the audience right out the window but we have a whole new set of of things that we should be thinking about so Based on those, those two things that you were talking about, the sort of eye contact with the camera and the vertical lines, maybe we can do a little bit of a, a fix up of my camera. Maybe, okay, so let's just do an experiment. Right now I'm looking at the camera for anybody who's watching on YouTube. So I'm talking to you. This should look more normal, I think. Right. And this is me looking at Dr. Bandler on the screen. Right. So this feels normal for me and it probably looks a little bit weird for viewers is that basically right. the so here's another extreme this is me looking over the camera if i maybe had some slides on the wall or something again it's not really i'm guessing you're feeling pretty weird about me staring <laughs> into space like this is that right but, but not only that uh, uh not only that adam imagine you were looking at another uh, you had dual monitors and you were looking over there or in fact, the slides that you were presenting mm. are there and the camera is over here and you're constantly looking in this direction. Um, you know, that may be okay for private meetings where they're really intensely technical and so right. on. 
but you can't watch that. You know, it, it's not human. If, if we were having coffee, if we were doing this over coffee, it would seem unnatural for you to be looking down at your coffee and for me to be looking down at my coffee and we never make eye contact. I mean, mm-hmm. we've evolved as humans to look into each other's eyes. So here's, here's a, a potential strategy that I was just thinking about. Um, so I, I recently bought an attachment webcam so I can move it around. So two ideas. One, maybe I can like move it a little bit lower so that it's closer to where <laughs> you show up on the screen. The other one, maybe I can just like put a little googly eyes on it and then pretend I'm speaking to the little camera guy. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, by the way, don't don't put don't have yourself full screen. Just push the 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 the, the zoom window, for example, higher up so that it's a little closer to the camera. Okay. Right. Right. And yeah. so the, the other thing that you pointed out was the, the what's in the background and the vertical lines. So when I first set up my camera, I was kind of set up like this, which was not ideal. Um, no, it, was made me look like I... it was much more extreme. <laughs> <laughs> it was extreme. And I also am sort of a mythical creature at this point. <laughs> no, I know. Really proper. I know. Yeah, very good. <laughs> So but anyway, like, you know, there's, there's lots more. There's lots more we can talk about on on all this, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's also the diff. You know, let's think for a moment about in person, virtual, and if you were doing a video, mm-hmm. you're doing a video. Now, in person, you would walk around. You might you know address someone over here. You address someone over there. If I were doing this right now, and I was sort of addressing somebody you would know right away I was not looking at a human. I think we are keenly aware, I think through facial expressions or whatever, if, if there was really a person there, you would know that I was addressed. I mean, unless I was a really good actor, you would know if I were faking that there was somebody there that I was talking to. Mm. But, but in, in person, you walk around, you look at this person, you go that, it looks natural. Here we have a fixed stare in a in a in a, a particular a particular point, and and when we look around, uh, you know, when it's an in-person presentation like a workshop, or you do look people in the eyes. Mm-hmm. Now, if you were a, if you are on stage as a as a as an actor, you probably don't look people in the eyes, but but you probably find somebody that you, and you give the illusion that you're looking at somebody. So you have the illusion that the actor is looking at you, but they're not really looking at you. Now, if you were having an interview, if this was an interview for a job or, or something like this uh, over the uh, over the internet, uh, if it were an interview, now uh, I would probably be looking in this direction. If, if, however, this was a recording, if if this was somehow recording. The interviewer could literally be sitting there and the cam- the interviewer's camera might be over here. So it would still look natural if I if it looked plausible that there was a human being I was talking to over here. Mm. So when you're doing some kind of documentary, you'll notice in documentaries, it, it, oh. it, it seems quite normal for the persons, even though the in- interviewer doesn't ask any questions, they're probably responding and they tend to be looking at, and it's clear that there is a person there they're looking at. Yeah. If no one else, the camera person, right? Right, that makes sense. Yeah, they very rarely does it come off like the interviewee is lecturing the audience. Um, right, right. Maybe that's another way to think about it. Exactly. So, uh, unless, unless it's literally what we're doing now. If you were interviewing mm-hmm. as you are now, it's norm- it would look odd if you were interviewing me over Zoom and I was looking in that direction. Okay, here's another small experiment. Do you mind pretending that I'm a little bit to the left of you? So look past the camera a little bit to the left. To the left. Your left, yeah. To my left. Yep. Okay, my left is here. Okay, that's your right. Right, okay. And now I'm going to do the same. And I wonder if this looks to the audience like we're talking to each other through a little wall. (laughs) Well, you know, maybe, you know, it. I can see you out of the corner of my eye and I can see your movements. I can see you move your head. Yeah. Uh, so I, 
I suppose we could fake that fake it that you are interviewing me, that you are literally here. Now let's see in the recording how the recording places us. Yeah. That'll that'll be interesting. I'm excited to to see that. So yeah. um oh, I'm a little bit out of focus. Now, now there we go. In the recording, let's see also whether we're in gallery view. Are you are we in gallery view on your on your monitor? On my monitor, we are in gallery view, and I believe that's how it records when I hit record. When you hit, yeah, when you hit record, uh, it should be, it, it'll remain in gallery view. Uh -huh. And on your monitor, how does it look when we when we do this? Are we looking at each other? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, if we fake it till you make it, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so these are these are things this in particular is something that probably will not come up as a, a you know a scientist explaining research or presenting or <laughs> interviewing something but you said that you also are preparing a digital um well digital is probably the wrong word a um maybe digital is the right word a a, a play for the fringe fest in in hamilton and this is all going to be online. So are these the kind of things that you are thinking about as you're writing this script? Well, I wish. I, I, I did try, you know, I did, I did try. As a matter of interest, it, it's a, it's a, I have a set of short plays, 10 minutes plus or minus. Um, eight of them finished, one of them half finished. Uh, they, they, uh, they range in genre from comedy through to sci-fi through mm -hmm. to um, uh, post-apocalyptic, if you can think of, of a post-apocalyptic post <laughs> coffee shop, right? So, so non-fiction. <laughs> <The last one. laughs> non so, no, but you know, I, it's hard, I, I wanted to set it over Zoom, like it was a Zoom coffee meet. Uh -huh. I couldn't do that. I, I, it's, an in, it's in two people in person in a coffee shop having a conversation. And okay. um, so I have eight of these completed. Um, I have 40 minutes in the digital exclusive section of the Hamilton Fringe Festival. Mm -hmm. So I have to produce a video of up to 40 minutes. And I'm looking for a digital stage manager. Oh. Yeah, a digital stage manager. Um, be kind of interesting. If, any, if anybody wants to work with me on that, let me know. Interesting, interesting. But uh, so what as I say, I'm like we're likely we're likely to do it over Zoom, but we could be doing some real videography if we can if we can somehow figure out how to do it without violating COVID restrictions. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that actually makes me think. Um, when you're when you're working on these sort of productions. Um, what overlap is there from when you were working on 3MT type stuff? So I know the three minute thesis typically would be a, a single slide in the background, a presenter speaking to you in person. Um, right. So you have sort of two points of focus that the audience wants to see. Um, I assume in your, your dialogue plays, you're going to have two points of focus, the two different characters. Is there any technology overlap? Like, are you planning on using any similar uh, programs or, or strategies for, for making that work? Well, well, let me put it this way. Um, in setting up, I've done a number of readings and I have, un I have a number of unlisted videos on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. that, I've, that I've taken for study purposes of the readings that we've done. And during those readings, we were as cognitive as cognizant as possible of backdrop, microphone quality, where the actor was sitting, and so on. But you know, there are technical limitations. There are issues with the camera. There are issues with the microphone. There is the backdrop. And you know, if the if the person at the other end doesn't have that technology, you have to make do with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, but we try to, within reason, you know do that and this idea of looking into the camera uh, of course these were readings so being readings they could they could either have the script in their hands or they could be reading off the screen but they were clever enough as actors to be able to take a quick look as if they were in fake that they were looking down at their coffee or at the table yep. and then get the line and then and deliver it into the camera um, but of course being Zoom, because they are Zoom meetings, 
they're still looking into the camera. So you still see two figures side by side talking to the camera. Mm -hmm. And it's not really, they're not really talking to each other. And because their backdrops are so different, it, it would still look odd that you fake them looking towards each other, but you can tell from the backdrops that they're not in the same environment. So there, there, there are some technical issues. And these were only readings. Now, for the, for the actual production that I'm hoping for, I'm hoping for something significantly better. Mm, okay. Um, but, you know, there's a host, host of other things. Right now, I think our bandwidth is good. We're coming across pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. But I've done some extensive coaching of three-minute thesis with, with candidates all the way from Saudi Arabia to India to China with internet connections that were quite unstable and so on and so forth. And those were all pre-recorded. I pre-recorded live presentations mm -hmm. for the actual event. And one of the things that it very quickly dawned on me is for an in-person presentation, and this is whether you're doing a video, uh, a pre-recorded video, whatever. I maintain that, that 120 words per minute is the maximum that you should have. If you're going beyond 120, you're rushing, you're going to trip over yourself, the audience isn't going to grab it. And by 120 minutes, if you have a long pause, if you, if you pause dramatically, you have to build the number of effective words in that pause into your 100. So this is 120 continuously spoken minutes. So if you have a long silence, add a number of words. Now, over the internet, because of the internet can be unstable and you're, you're, you're trying to get something across, I would cut that down to 110 words per minute. Sure, and sure. in your script, build in redundancy because I've got occasional dropped signal, that occasional freezing of the frame. You know, and this is, this is true when you do a technical presentation. There's a lot of voiceover PowerPoints and a lot of other technical presentations that are done over the, recorded over the internet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or you're giving a webinar over the internet live. You're speaking at high speed, your, your frame freezes, the sound drops. People say, what did he just say? Or what did she just say? Yeah. Um, so build in redundancy. And there's nothing wrong. You can you can build it. it we, we often repeat ourselves. We often repeat ourselves, as I've just done now. And it <laughs> still, it can still make it sound natural uh -huh. um, by repeating certain key points so that you, you don't be efficient the way you are in a script that's going to be read. Because in a script, people can go back and look at it again. They can say, oh, what was this word? Oh, or this acronym. They kind of go, oh, that's what the acronym means. You can't yeah. rewind somebody in real time. Yeah, so, that's a really good point. And it kind of reminds me of um, sitting through lectures. I don't know how many times I've been at a lecture and then something has come up or I couldn't quite hear a specific word or two. And I feel like I'm just thrown completely out of the lecture. I, I don't know where we went. I, I don't know how to get back in. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I agree totally. And that's why I say by, by, by disciplining yourself to do this kind of presentation and being aware, the whole idea is, you know what the technical limitations are. Mm -hmm. You may be speaking in your own environment and you can hear yourself speak, but can your audience hear you? Has your audience heard that word? So there are often key acronyms or word, and I would avoid acronyms, but, but you know, some key words that come right out of the blue. Occasionally, you have you have a text, 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 and suddenly there's a word that is completely unexpected. And if you miss, if the audience misses that word, the rest of the paragraph that you have prepared so well, with no redundancy at all, is mm -hmm. gone. So introduce redundancy, and you know that's an engineering principle in communications. I was going to ask about that. It sounds familiar. Is what the redundancy is what helps pinpoint, you know, some, something specific. You say to me, can you hear me? And I'd say, yes, I heard you. So repeat that word. I repeat the word. Okay, so we're constantly repeating to each other to make sure we understand each other perfectly. But when you're doing a, a webinar live over the internet, 
um, or a presentation, uh, you may have technical difficulties, so be cognizant because the audience, the audience is craving to understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This kind of reminds me of those uh, those picture puzzles that you sometimes see on TV, where it starts with the most blurred picture you could possibly imagine, and it slowly comes into more focus, and you're you're challenged to see when you actually know what that picture is. That's kind of how I'm thinking about um, a, a poor internet connection. Like if, uh, if I'm dropping every other syllable or something, then can you really understand what the picture is? Um, but we can add more of these pixels, I guess, by being redundant a little bit in our speech, you know, coming back around to the same point. And, uh, you know, if they missed a couple pixels here and there, say it again, they might miss a couple of different ones, but they can, you know, put it all together. And, and really by good. the way, by the way, this is also true for people whose uh, uh, native language is not necessarily English, where they may have trouble with articulating and, and so on. So this is true for in-person presentations, any kind of presentation. Hmm. If, if you know that what you're pronouncing may be misunderstood, make extra effort to pronounce it properly, but repeat it. Because when you repeat it, the audience, oh, oh, that's what he just said. Right, right, right. So, so, you know, something comes, and, and I, I've done, been doing this for years with in-person presentations, but I think it's even more necessary over the internet. And uh, you want, and key words that absolutely need to stick, mm -hmm. you've got to find subtle ways of doing it. One very subtle way of doing it is you end a sentence with, you know, the uh, the important piece of information you begin the next sentence with the important piece the important piece of information is oh oh that's what he said so you, so you you kind of and and it it's quite natural you're not going to be it's, it's not unnatural it's just being aware of how you come across yeah that makes a lot of sense and that actually might be even if you do it, um, you know, in person consistently, if this is something that you do, you know, pretty well when you're giving a regular presentation, it's probably something that you should think about explicitly when you're doing these, these digital things, just because you don't really have that, uh, you know, you don't see the person in the audience nodding necessarily, and you don't know how your words are coming across. So you... Maybe this this is a good reminder for you know excellent speakers that they they really do want to build in you know pauses and redundancy and you know reiterate what you've said before right. just to make sure everybody's all on the same page and you you know you get those virtual right. nods right exactly exactly and you know you're, you're, that's a good point you take, you're just not getting that feedback because if you are if you are uh, you know, let's say a master of your subject. So that means you can kind of ad lib or improvise as needed. And mm -hmm. you see somebody in the audience looks very puzzled. You can kind of intuitive slow down a little bit. You might even be tempted to repeat what you just said. And you mm -hmm. can do that imperceptibly and then see that person's face light up. But you don't see that over the internet. And you've got to somehow, and by the way, rehearsing, if you're doing something that's important over the internet, uh, you know, a, a presentation, um, or, or you, whether you're recording a video for yourself, practice with somebody who hasn't heard you yeah. and ask them if they've understood every word. And, um, and any word that isn't understood or kind of falls flat, repeat it, say it slowly, articulate it carefully. Because as you say, you know, you, you know, people want to understand what they're listening to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess um, I know people sometimes don't like to practice their talks because it feels so uncomfortable if you're, you know, at home and practicing all alone. But uh, I guess now is the time to get good at that because that's what every presentation feels like to me now, at least. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and by the way, one of the things I tell people in, uh, when they're doing, a, let's say, a presentation, um, one of the things that I say is um, notice the space above my head is very short. So mm -hmm. have this, the kind of uh, framing of my, of me from more or less from the waist up is the sort of, it's kind of an optimal stance because people can see your hands. 
See, right. no weapons. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I do not pose a threat. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't be up close like this, like a little talking head into the, into the screen. Try to be further back if you can. And uh, so that your hands are visible, you can use your hands. It's, it is more engaging. Yeah, I remember you saying this last time we spoke. Uh, you can almost picture, um, you know, you're a, a a speaker or you know a president or something behind a podium. You know, you want to have, you know, I guess I'm not doing it exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a little bit more. Uh... The often you see people clutching the podium, right? Yes, <laughs> something like this almost. Right. Right, and and don't do this. It, 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 never bring your hands together. This is this is defensive. This is a defensive. People can see that you're nervous if you do that. Yeah. So what never, have I gotten here? Avoid. <laughs> yeah. Avoid bringing your hands together. Avoid doing this. Uh -huh. Okay. Avoid kind of. This is very defensive. Mm -hmm. This is defensive. So you may be moving your hands around and then bringing them close. The only reason to bring your hands together is to show that we are united. <laughs> the, united yeah. we stand, divided we fall. <laughs> yeah, that There's makes no sense. other reason. Don't bring your hands together for any other reason. I don't think you would do that in, in, in person, so. It... Oh, 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 no, you haven't seen people in person. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time, you're right, it's been a while. <laughs> no nervous speakers, students in particular, they'll go up and they, they'll stand like this and do a mm. presentation. <laughs> wow it's a it's a whole new world of, of techniques but i think a lot of it comes down to the same sort of motivations i like what you were talking about of you know no weapons you know you want to make people comfortable right you know that that's always going to be what it comes down to with these strategies and you know right. things aren't really changing that much just right. you have to apply it to the the <laughs> yeah and by the way this also shows that i'm not not uh, checking my cell phone true right? true <laughs> i'm not checking my cell phone you see i'm not doing anything else and uh i'm i'm concentrating entirely on you my favorite is uh when you see somebody in a meeting doing something like this i don't know if you can tell with my eyes yeah, which reminds me i know, I know. <laughs> are you reading something <laughs> But, and that's when they're not speaking, right? They're, they're oh, yeah. not speaking. I know, I know, um, I know. But here's another issue. And, and this is really something, I, you know, people are exhausted. Zoom is exhausting everybody. People, people are fed up with Zoom and similar platforms. In the evening, they just want to get away from this kind of platform. Why? Because of the totally unnatural interaction we're having. It, it, it puts a lot, of, a lot of stress on us. Yeah. And um, uh, so, and I've noticed with even with 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 plays that have been performed over Zoom, actors that I know very well seem to become become lazy. They say, "Well, I have a screen; I can read it off the screen. I don't have to memorize it." You would never think of going on stage except in an emergency with a script in your hand. It, it's done if the director has to step in because an actor is sick and they just have to go in with a script. Right. But the idea of being off book, uh, you know, in an in-person play is, is, is absolute. You've got to be off book. But somehow people get lazy and they start reading off the screen. And in my, in my um, coaching of students, I'll say, you've got to memorize it. The audience can see your eyes moving. Do not do this. And by the way, here's another clue. Even with in-person presentations, you sometimes see eyes doing this. Guess why? Because when they memorize that script, they can all, they're almost reading. They, their eyes were moving you know, in, 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 in rhythmically with the lines. So someone who has not memorized their script well, whether it's in person or virtual, may mm -hmm. well be doing this. What that shows me is that they haven't memorized it enough. Ah, interesting. Because you need to be able to memorize it in such a way that you can walk down the street saying it. You can you can cross the road. You can you can you can uh, you know tie your shoelaces, walk around. So what I what I say is, you're really off book. You really memorize this. 
when you, you know, you, you don't have to have, you, you, you're no longer a slave to where that word is on that page or where that word was on the page. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You want to be in a position where not only does it feel like it is spontaneous and kind of off the cuff, but Certainly, if it's a science presentation, you want to be so confident in the, the stuff that you know that it could be off the cuff and seem that polished, even if it's right. you know, fully scripted. Right. Yeah, I totally get that. Right. But, you know, if, if it's a if, when I do a slide presentation over the internet and a Zoom meeting, as I'm going to be doing very soon, mm -hmm. um, workshops coming up pretty soon. Um, I, I will look at the screen. I will look at the slide because I'm not going to memorize everything. I'll look at the slide. To, oh, yeah, that's the next topic I want to cover. And uh, because I'm not going to memorize the contents of 50 or 60 slides uh, For sure. verbatim. And uh, because I, I still have to look at the slide to make sure that the slide is, is, is the one I want. Yeah, for sure. So maybe this is a good time to to ask you about that. So you have some uh, some workshops and things coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Are they open to McMaster students in general, or is this an right? Right. Right now, I am planning a workshop, and uh, a, a, along with um, Rachel Ho from psychology and neuroscience, uh, mm -hmm. Michelle Abradik from kinesiology, Daniel Tajik from electrical engineering. These are all great speakers. Lots of track record. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be giving a workshop that is suitable for the new um, competition that the School of Graduate Studies will unveil shortly. Okay. It's going to be sometime in February. The reason I cannot pin the date down is because I'm due for major back surgery next okay. Wednesday. And I'm going to be laid up for a number of days and uh, it's keeping fingers crossed it'll go well. This was sprung on me literally two days ago. Oh, wow. And, I'm so sorry uh, to hear that. Well, good luck, huh? Yeah, thank you. It, it's the second time I'm having this done. And okay. this is a full day operation. And uh, so I can't pin down the date for you. It's, but, but it will be announced by the School of Graduate Studies. And I will be sending out, um, you know, announcements. Right, right. Okay. That, sound, that sounds great. And uh, we'll definitely link to all of that um, when we have details, when, when the show goes up and everything. Right. Like that. I'll, let, I'll let you know for sure. Yeah. 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 That sounds great. Yeah. So that's coming up soon. Um, February. Yeah. It'll be, it'll okay. be I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for it to be in the second or third week of February. Okay. Sounds good. And, uh, and by the way, anybody who wants any help, uh, should just email me, and I'm I'm happy to talk to them about whatever they, whatever their project is. That's awesome. That's really generous. I'll also share the uh, links to some of the videos that you've um, put together. I know there's a lot of stuff that you can get out of there, even if it's not explicitly a workshop for speaking. There's a lot of stuff on Dr. Bandler's YouTube channel that will help you with your public speaking if you, you know, if you want to look at things critically. Uh, there's a lot of three minute thesis talks. There's, uh, there's some readings, um, some performances from your plays. Yeah. Um, and I think last year it was, we, we went through a couple of these, these talks and sort of dissected them. So right. that's something you could, you could do on your own if you would like, if you want to spend some time on, uh, on Dr. Bandler's YouTube channel, I highly recommend it. There's some really good stuff there. Yeah. And, and the, the most, the most recent, um, video that I have was from my from a, a, a workshop I did with my department uh, it is on my YouTube channel, the most recent one, and that has an analysis of a couple of um, uh, three minute thesis presentations, um, and and the analysis is also is also done of opening lines, of titles, of slide presentation, and uh, the the authors of those. Are, were actually online being interviewed at the same time for their comments. Oh, cool. That's great. Find it on my most recent video. I will definitely be checking that out as soon as we, uh, <laughs> as soon as we split up here. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're getting pretty close to time, I think. Um, is there any sort of last minute things that you want to mention? Any sort of take homes that you want to, you know, put a bow on before we, uh, we wrap up for the day? 
Yes, it's it's all about the. It's not about you. It's about the audience. My body words. That's it. That's it right there. That's everything you need to know about performance. I think. Yeah. Great. So, okay. I mean, that's in a nutshell. You want a, an expansion of that? Yeah. Let, tell me why. <laughs> why is it not about me? <laughs> uh. Well, because the more you give to the audience, the more you get from the audience. And if you make things clear to the audience, they'll, you'll, they'll be excited, they'll be fired up, they'll pepper you with questions, find you, find you engaging to speak to, and they may share some ideas with you that they might not have shared otherwise. Uh, you get a tremendous amount of feedback from audience, the better you craft your presentation, the more relevant feedback you're going to get from the audience. If you if, if your work is unintelligible, your presentation is unintelligible, people will just walk away. Sure. And, and, you, and you really don't find out. You may, you may not get the kind of feedback that could actually be even more beneficial. So in the long run, it really is about you. <laughs> but it's only about you if it's first about the audience. That makes a lot of sense. If, you know, we're not doing any of this research or performances or anything like that, just to have it sit on YouTube, not interacted with or sit in a, a research journal right. unread. You know, you're right. presenting these things to bounce ideas off of people or show, hey, this is what I've done can you expand on it? Or do you have any ideas where we can take this further? Or do you think I did this right? I guess, yeah. And when they come to you with that sort of feedback, that's going straight back into improving yourself. That makes, that makes right. a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and one other thing we haven't quite talked about, when there's a, when there's a deadline or a limit on, on how long you can speak, whether it's one minute, whether it's three minutes or five minutes, mm -hmm. don't hit the deadline. Don't rush at high speed to, to just to be a few seconds under that deadline. It's not a race. In fact, you're not going to engage the audience that way at all. So a high octane, you know, fast and furious presentation where the words are just flying forward is just doesn't just doesn't work. It, it never works. It never works. The one exception that I can think of where people try to present as quickly as possible seems to be like competitive debates. And I think that has to do with like how the rules are designed. I think that it's not about convincing judges or anything. I think it's about how many ideas can you present in, in a lot of time and how many can your opponent um, address in that allotted time. So in that case, you're trying to be, you know, fast, furious and obscure. But, but, uh, but generally, they may be very articulate. If, if you are extremely articulate and every word Every syllable is clear and crisp. Sure, you can go at high speed. And if the words are short, if the words are short, if the, everybody can understand what you're saying, but if you, start, if you start speaking in jargon and technicalese, and yeah. then you fire that off at high speed because of your favorite research subject with words and terminology nobody can understand, uh, it's, it, it, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. so, so avoid particular if you want to be engaging to the general public, avoid jargon altogether or make jargon sound like a label rather than a, a word that needs to be understood. Mm. So, for example, Bluetooth or, or, or DNA is a label. You don't, we don't, most people don't understand Bluetooth. True. Okay. It's like a little black box. We, yeah, we know Bluetooth. the purpose. Exactly. So it becomes a label. That be, oh, yeah, I have Bluetooth. You have Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. Nobody, people don't know what it is. But they understand, they've, they've heard of it before. So that's, that becomes a label rather than jargon. Yeah, but true. You and Bluetooth, in a technical sense, in terms of microwave uh, radiation and, and, and energy and so on, then, mm -hmm. then it then say, oh my God, I don't now I thought I knew what Bluetooth was. Now I don't know what it means anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. And I guess as a label, Bluetooth for a lot of people stands in as just wireless connectivity to something exactly. as well. It's, it doesn't have to be Bluetooth even. Yeah, and, exactly. And but if you use it, 
in a way that requires a technical understanding, then you're losing the audience. Yeah. Well, these are really good take homes. And I think these are going to be very useful to people. I mean, I've, I've already improved myself <laughs> during this talk <laughs> and leading well, up to this talk. So this is a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. So Adam, uh, it's I feel like I've really pleasure. taken advantage of your time here. I'm, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> you know, filling, filling time and killing time, right? Hey, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on again. You're, it's always a pleasure to have you. There's always a lot that you're doing and a lot of, for, for us to learn from. So thank you so much. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate it. Thank you.